All right, let's get going. Uh, so this is, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, just want to say thank you for, for being here, being part of the Brewers Association, uh, just you know, you know, helping us make this a great conference uh, and, and just doing what you're doing across the state. So really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for visiting the sponsors. They help make this possible. So yeah, so I really appreciate it. Uh, today we have a fun uh, presentation, I think, uh, <laughs> with our friend uh, and cast master, uh, Bradley Gillette. Yep, there you go, from uh, Seneca Lake Brewing. Uh, he's gonna give us all the ins and outs and ask, answer any questions that we have. So take it away. Awesome, appreciate it. Now, I'm not one for microphones. I think they're intrusive. So I'm just gonna scream a shout. So if you can't hear me at the back, then just let me know. Um, but really what I wanna do is kind of have this session as more of an interactive session. I wanna hear from you. I wanna understand if you're doing what you're doing, how you're doing things as it pertains to car scales as well. Uh, give you a little bit of backstory about me. Uh, I am Seneca Brewing Company and the bureaucracy. This is my favorite picture in the world. I stole some girls' glasses and some are shining, I think, but it lights my face up ridiculously. Uh, but yeah, I'm Seneca Brewing Company and the bureaucracy and uh, we're just about to open a new space on Seneca Lake right on the water called the Waterfront, Waterfront Grill at Sherman Restaurant Bar. Well, um, Seneca Lake Brewing Company. All we do is car scale. We don't do anything so other than car scale. So, um, you know, it's, it's a big thing for me coming into a beer scene oh, okay. where we've got amazing brewers, we've got amazing brewers, and I've had the pleasure of meeting so many of you this week as well, and learning from you as well. We're going to try and take that back and introduce some of that into kind of the cast side of things that we do. Um, but really, just want to make this interactive and like, like I said, I'm not here to tell you how to brew a car scale. A car scale is brewed in pretty much the exact same way that you're brewing your beer today with the exception of maybe the secondary fermentation in the cask uh, and so forth. So this is really more about the, the car scale, car scale programs, what you guys can do, what it's going to benefit you uh, kind of in the long run, but also some of those trials and tribulations around starting a cast program as well. Um, I'm also, and I will pre-check this, I hate the PowerPoint slides. They're the most boring thing in the world. Like literally, your attention is more focused on that than it is on me. So I've got 10 slides. They're not the best slides in the world either. So definitely want to make that clear up front. But, uh, we're going to kick things off with, um, you know, from my perspective, moving over here from the UK, one of the biggest things and reasons that I decided to <coughs> open up a car scale brewery was because I saw there was a massive untapped market of car scale in the US. You know, that's also dwindling in the UK now, but here in the US, there were a couple of breweries back then in 2004 when I moved over to the US that were really doing anything as it pertained to car scale. So that helped me drive my decision and um, like thought process around how I was going to build out my brewery and create something that was a differentiator between us and other people, but also use it as a platform to educate people and bring something new to the marketplace as well. Um, today, there are more and more people discovering car scale. So you'll go to bars, I'm sure you've all been to a bar, where they may have one single beer engine, which is the old school pull, pump, fashion, of pulling a beer. Those bars are finding more and more people are actually veering towards the car scales as a beverage that they can enjoy, they can kind of comprehend in terms of more of that flavor build up, the flavor profile in that cast. But also, you know, I'm not sexist or anything, women love car scales. The reason they love car scales is because it doesn't get them gassy and bloated when they're drinking it. So that's a hugely untapped market that we can all get into. Um, from your guys' perspective, I think there's also a massive opportunity to create additional revenue streams in your tap rooms by introducing a cask or some sort of cask program. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Um, it's also not hard to create a cask program in your brewery. Like I mentioned earlier, the brewing process is exactly the same. 
but you can utilize your existing gears and your existing portfolio to enterprise a segmented cast program and have fun with it and create a new audience, but also educate the pre-existing audience, and that just creates additional revenue streams across the board as well. Um, and then the final one, opportunity to play with your gigs. How many people here have a pilot system? Do you get to play with your gigs and do like a one barrel match or whatever it may be? So for the majority of you, it's gonna be hard to experiment and play with the gig. Introducing a cast program, you can use your pre-existing beers and you can use the cast as a vessel to actually have fun, play around with it, test things in terms of the market, what people like, what people don't like, and so forth as well. Um, before we go into this, I want to ask the crowd, how many people have actually done a cast in the past? All right, so just under 50%. All right. Um, how many people do a cast on a regular basis, talking once a month? Okay, pin that down. How many do that kind of uh, firk and fry? Two. All right, all right, cool. So that helps me frame out more for later as well. So with a cast program, you know, there are going to be challenges, there are going to be risks. Um, first and foremost, there's going to be additional costs. You're going to end up having to buy casts. And further. So that's adding to your Cooper, you've got costs associated with that. You've got the taps, you've got the bones, you've got the style, all the other elements, the rack systems. If you want to put it far top, then yeah, you've got the rack system. If you want to actually do a traditional style through a British beer engine, you've got to drop a uh, British beer engine as well. Uh, one of the biggest risks, and again, we'll talk about the kind of successes, is the lifespan and the longevity of a car. So from the minute you tap a cast, you've got about 10 days to sell the contents of that cast because obviously air's coming in, it's going to start oxidizing the, the beer in the actual cast. So you've got to have that kind of market emphasis and ability to know you're going to get the consumers through the door to make sure you're selling that beer. Otherwise, you're going to end up in that whole wastage game. You're dumping 40 pints of beer, 50 pints of beer, whatever it may be. Um, also, as Brewery owners or breweries, you're going to have this visibility. Knowing the marketability in your area of car scale. So knowing your customers, knowing and understanding why they're coming to your brewery in the first place, what their likes are, what their dislikes are in terms of the beers, and what your thought process is in terms of, is this something I can actually market to them? And if you can market it to them, then chances are you'll be able to create a successful cast program. Uh, staff training, big thing. You cannot handle a car scale in the same way you handle a keg beer. We've all slung kegs down, stairs, whatever it might be. With a cast, you have to baby it. You have to nurture it. You have to love on it. To the degree that, and I've done it a couple of times, one of my favorite beers, I'll hardly still, I've kissed the cask before I've actually tapped it. So you've definitely got to focus on staff training with the employees so they have that knowledge about the handling, the management of the cask, the pulling of the beer and the actual glass as well. Uh, and then a big one, you know, we still get this every single day at our brewery, is consumer education around cask. Americans love to think that English or car scale is warm and flat beer. <laughs> it, excuse my French, pisses the shit out of me. Really. That being said, you know, there are things you can do to educate the consumer, let them understand, let them know, whether it's in signage, signage whether it's on your menus, whether it's just through education of your stock. So when someone's pouring a cast and they're actually introducing it to the consumer, they're educating the consumer on, this is what you're gonna taste. This is why the temperature is like this. This is why the CO2 levels are a lot different versus trying that beer out of our keg and draft system as well. So those are some of the things. Uh, on the consumer education thing, uh, there was actually a survey. Uh, it, excuse my French, I swear a lot like British. Um, it does piss me off the fact there's not more kind of like studies and research, maybe I should just do this, studies and research around car scale in the US. 
You know, there was back in the uh, like 2017, 2018 era, and then pre that as well. But right now there is nothing. But this was taken from a 2018 study of what customers thought about car scale. And some of them I absolutely love. Pointless. <laughs> Beer has got alcohol in it. It's still beer. That's stupid. Old man. Old man. I mean, that would absolutely fit the Kyle first demographic. <laughs> um, the old man, bitter. So bitter always makes me laugh because one of the most popular car scales in the UK is a bitter. It's an English pair there. But because of that naming terminology, people think that every car scale is bitter. And again, it's ridiculous. Warm and flat is a big one as well. So these are just some of those kind of words that they gleaned from that survey in terms of what people think about car scale. So for us as brewers and brewery owners and taproom staff, we've got a long way to go to kind of take this and pivot it to more of a kind of a better approach and feeling that people have around car scale versus don't know. Um, so just a couple of them. I can share this slide with you if you want. Uh, you can put it in your tap room. And, um, <laughs> uh, so success. Uh, my friend Keith Redhead up there from uh, Woodland Farm Brewery, he does a car scale festival every single year. It's absolutely awesome. Definitely recommend participating in that if you haven't already. Um, so from a success standpoint, you know, from my perspective, and I'm not going to preach to you, you know, you are your own brewery, so you can understand what's going to sell, what can't sell, and so forth. But 100%, I know that you can make a success out of a car scale program. You know, there is new revenue that you can drive from adding a task into your portfolio. You know, whether that's a Firkin Friday, whether that's a Firkin once a month, variety of different things that you can do. It's also going to help you increase your beverage portfolio on your menu. I've been to breweries, I've been to some bars that they actually have a subsection on their menu that is all just car scale. And again, they're not going way outside of the ballpark to create a whole brand new lineup. They're using some of their pre existing beers, but just offering something that people can come in and understand kind of this is how it is on a cast versus this is how it is out of a keg. Um, there's also that new educational component. I don't know about many of you, but I'd say I'm kind of forced into doing this in our tap room with all of our staff in the fact that no one in America knows what car scale is and why it's so warm and flat, but it allows you to add more of an experience to your consumers that are coming into your tap room as well by educating them on the beer flavors they're going to get because of the temperature variable and also uh, on the lower levels of carbonation as well. And then the bottom one is really, like I say, the opportunity for you to play with your existing beers. So there's nothing stopping you taking one of your existing beers out of the fermenter. Probably I would recommend taking kind of the last element or last smidgen out of the fermenter so you get more of that like yeast in there as well. Putting it into a cask and then throwing whatever adjuncts you want in there. That's a huge option because We've done it a number of times. We actually did a beer with Lucky Hair a couple of years ago. It's an oyster stout. And we used 100 live uh, Blue Point oysters in that beer, and we took half, half of the batch on cars. They took up their half of the batch on keg. And the difference in those two beers was ridiculous. Ours was more of that salty brininess and just, is this really a stout, or am I just drinking ocean water, which is flat? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and then you would go to the Lucky Hair side and they uh, tried their beer and it was more of that stout forward, but that silky rich richiness on the back end with a touch of salt on the back. So if you think about, this gives you the option just by using one cask out of a single bag, using whatever you want in it, to then offer them side by side. And again, that comes down to the educational component of this is Two different, uh, same beer, but two different serving methodologies that is going to blow your mind between the differences of those two beers as well. Um, also, for those that we were talking about earlier, uh, that don't have a small pilot system, you could use it as a proofing system. Because you can take that beer, you can play around with it, have fun with it, put it out on the bar, see how well it sells. If it sells, upscale it. Do a massive batch on it and do it as a keg. 
whatever it may be, because you've only got that one cast so that's acting as that vessel where you're adding the adjuncts and then you're doing the secondary fermentation and so forth as well. So there's a lot of things that I think, you know, everyone can do. Um, my personal recommendation, if you haven't already done a cast program, if you want to get into doing a cast program, you know, I'm always available, my brothers are available, Megan's available, uh, definitely reach out to us. But I would recommend starting small. Go out, invest in a pit, 5.4 gallons, allow you to start small, throw it up on the bar top, see how it goes. But part of that is you've got to market it. Because if you don't market it, then no one's going to know you're doing it. And that demographic of people that love car scale, they're not going to come to your place because they don't know you do a car scale. So you definitely got to market to your audience. Uh, and then through that, Nutritionally, you can just grow that audience. The more you keep doing it, the more consistent you are with it, the more people you're going to get coming out. I'll use one brewery in particular, um, good friends of mine up at Flying Bison. They do amazing casts, and they do a car scale program every single Friday, and it taps at three o'clock. They normally kick to Firkin, which is 80 pints by five. And it's because they're consistent, they're doing new things, but they're also taking their standard beers and they're using some extras in that cast that they're actually tapping as well. Uh, listen to your audience as well. Um, you know, we have people and customers are coming to our place and they're talking about, I would love to try this style of beer in a cast, or I would love to try that. So listen to your audience because they're the ones that are basically going to buy the beer from you. They're going to be spending the money over the bar. So if you listen to your audience, that will help you grow that audience and then also expand that program as well. But then, as time goes on, expand the program. You know, build it out, grow it out. I mean, I would love, my whole goal is to see more breweries doing cask in the United States. And if I could start small in New York State, even though it's pretty big, if I start there, then I can then start hopefully working with the Brewers Association to create more of a national program and even institute things like, I would love to see, like, a cask week where all of the breweries from around the state come together and we all do a cast for that particular week. Because I think that will help not only us as an industry, but also your individual locations, breweries, by creating those additional streams, the uh, new audiences and so forth as well. But uh, like I say, I'm not one for PowerPoint presentations and I want to make this interactive. I also need a beer. So I'm going to quickly stop talking him in. But I uh, definitely want to let you know that Masks do have feelings. Masks <laughs> 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 yeah. need to be nurtured, like I say. So we've got to start introducing them. We've got to start making them feel welcome to us, uh, putting them on the bar and showing them that love as well. And funnily enough, you know, there are people that you would be surprised that do like cars. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of the weirdest people that you think are, you know, just that cause like Miller like Bug like aficionado does like a car scale as well. So with that, like I say, that is of my last PowerPoint slide. I'm gonna leave it on there because everyone loves Carl's face. I wanna hear from you. I wanna like understand kind of what your thoughts are, what questions you've got for me and everything that I can help and encourage you to create a kind of program. Yeah. Um, you talked about Introducing Aaron and the, the time, I guess, the length of the cast. Your thoughts on CO2 breathers and things like that to extend some of that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> yes. Um, Keener. Being a brick. I effing hate them. Absolutely. So that's the power of the category. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, they serve a book. They really, really do. Uh, in the UK, would I ever use a cast breather? Never. Oh, absolutely never. But the reason for that is in the UK, we're shifting a lot more beer from the cast than we are over here in state New York. So over here, and especially with programs that you're not going to put in, like cast ale breathers or cast breathers, they won't work if you're doing bond. But if you're putting a tap or a tap or two, it's a good option. Because you know, you're gonna have that CO2 bed sitting on top of the beer, it's gonna eliminate any of the actual oxygen in the beer. And so I think the average timeline is you get about another five to seven days out of the cast when using a breather. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, personally, I would recommend if you are getting started on a car scale program, you have those beer engines, it's a good investment, definitely. Thanks. 
Oh, no. Hey, baby. <laughs> I think you know what I'm going to ask. What's your favorite way to prime a cast? <laughs> Carbonate. Sorry. Uh, Carbonate. Um, we use priming sugar. Okay. To be honest. Um, we have done some others and other ways of doing it, but the old tried and true method is just priming sugar. Mm -hmm. You know, you do your touch of priming sugar in there. We do a, a CO2 purge of the cask as well mm -hmm. before we put the beer in uh, on top of that. My recommendation, again, is convenient, it's cheap, it's easy, it's sure. priming sugar. You can use table sugar. Go out and do table sugar, just make sure it's fully dissolved and then below a certain temperature before you put it in the cask and you'll be good to go. Uh, on that point as well, secondary uh, fermentation, which is where the carbonation occurs, uh, the average timeline is two weeks. Don't, and so many people that I know have done this, they've done a cask and they try to mu uh, rush it to the tap within a week and flat. Uh, because that secondary fermentation, natural carbonation, needs a minimum two weeks to actually create that carbonation. On average, on our beers, we're leaving them for three weeks. Just give them that extra week, they can sit, they can rest, and let all that occur in the cask. Did you say it's flat? Sure. <laughs> Stop <laughs> tickling me. So at that point, I found when I add fruit to, to a cask, it takes a minimum of three weeks, yep. maybe even a little longer, so yep. the fully carbonated. Yeah, so when you're adding fruit, are you still doing priming with the sugar? No, you know, you're just that's what you're using the residual sugar on the actual fruit itself. Yeah, so, and I think that comes down, so I don't know the, like, math behind all of that, and I just think it's because of the density of the sugar in the fruit versus just straight sugar that you put them into it. Um, the second question is, do yeah. you add additional yeast to your casks, or do you use the yeast that's already in the, in the beer? Yep, we just use the original yeast that's in the beer when we're actually putting it into secondary. So you can, I've heard that some breweries doing that, but we don't. So if you have, you know, um, a barrel age mm -hmm. beer, and um, you want to carbonate it, do you add yeast at that point? Let's say like an old, like a year old here. Right. In, in, in a barrel. Do uh, these? you You can, and then you just prime it. Right. Um, you can. Uh, we do barrel aging on some of our beers as well. Now, it's not obviously a wooden barrel, it's still one of the stainless, uh, like our Harvest Ale, our Christmas Ale, our Old Ale. Um, the way in which we do it is we'll brew that beer ahead of time, knowing that, yeah, we were just barrel aging will still take out that um, yeast and sediment that's as part of the <coughs> fermenter, put it in, prime it, tuck it away, and in a year's time it's still perfectly good. The, the rule of thumb on the yeast is if you're moving the cask, I think it's eight times. You can move it eight times, because every time you shift up all that stuff in the cask and everything, it's just reducing the usage of it in the future. So, yeah, I mean, I think you've got like eight moves that you can do on a car. So if you're going to do it like a beer that you want to release in a year's time, make sure you put it in that space where you want it to store for a year and then try not to touch it. Okay. Uh, so when you have, I've got, I've got cast by the pallet at this point. And um, uh, the old sort of like putting two cast mixes in with each other and soaking them and processing the PPW, rinsing them, sanitizing, can't do that anymore. It's way time consuming. So how do we do it? My sister brewer is breaking my back to have them down on the floor. And I'm like, what? So what are, uh, there's got to be some sort of manifold or something that I can use to multiple, clean multiple casts at one time quickly. And, yeah. yeah. Um, there's, there is. Um, to be honest, we need to build something. Like, if you come to our brewery, our cask cleaner, was built by a caveman. It really was. Um, yeah, I mean, it's basically a pump, and then it's uh, a plastic box that has a spray ball, and then the host connections, and you've got your caustic in the actual box, and it's just recycling that through, and then we've got a separate one when we're doing the sanding and the rinse and everything like that. So you can build something. I'll, I can even share with you the, the place where we built ours. Yep, yep. Um, 
Like, we don't have these crazy automated systems where it's kind of press and walk off and you've got 50 million cars just lining up like soldiers and then, oh, it's my turn, I'm going to get killed. <laughs> Nothing like that whatsoever. It's totally manual. And it will be, but you can ease some of that, like, rough stuff. Yeah, because all those shit now, because they want to, you know, put them side to side, they end up wanting to roll away, and they're the answers. Oh, yeah. 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 Unfortunately, one of my big beefs with the industry, or cops, should I say, is they haven't devised a way that's automated to pull the bones. Oh, that's the most time consuming thing in the world. If you get, you, you know, you get your iron, you put it in there and you pull it, and then it doesn't catch, and then suddenly it takes you 20 minutes to pull one bug out of the car. You know, I just wasted a whole day pulling cars. So that would be nice in the future, but you know, you can get some of it. There's some pump in here, I can show you the little There's some pump in here. One of your sync phase with a piece of PVC and it's very well and you just set it on. Yeah. It's 50 bucks for a Yeah. And I will say, and I'll come to you here and say, I will say that one of the big things I would recommend as soon as a, as, as soon as a cast kicks, you just do a water rinse on it. Yeah. Because with all that yeast and sediment in the cart, that will stick. It will conglomerate the inside of the car, and then it just makes cleaning ten times harder. And you got some gear and thing in there that you put in on some yeah. like puzzle bag. It's like, yeah. 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 oh, I would you come back and you're like, what the? <laughs> I would, I would <laughs> never recommend putting a freaking bag of hops into a car because whoever's cleaning that car later on, they're gonna hate you. Because <laughs> <laughs> you just can't get that. It's weird. Sorry. Uh, I was curious if you have experiment, experimented with binding casks at all? We have. What yep. procedures would you recommend for that? Um, we used to use Isinglass, uh, but we veered away from <coughs> that because uh, the whole gluten issue and, and vegan issue and stuff like that. Um, now, we don't use any. It, it's a time game. We just give them that time and let them drop their own natural occurrence. And so far, we haven't really had any issues in that regard at all. Uh, there are a number of solutions you can use out there for binding. Uh, but really, from my perspective, and as a, a true grip, um, I would just use the time game. Within three weeks, you should have a clean beer. Uh, again, it's also going to come down to, all right, so where you're brewing the beer, where it's being stored in secondary fermentation, and then where you're moving the beer to in terms of tapping it and pouring it, uh, you also need to give it that time to kind of sit and rest mm -hmm. before you actually tap it, whether that's using the cast witch system on an actual beer engine, or whether that's using your traditional hand tap kind of to smash in the side as well. But yeah, I would recommend the time game, but it's everyone's choice. One thing I would like to uh, just kind of jump back to the, the, the priming uh, side of things is also be cognizant of what type of uh, serving method it is going to be. If it's, if it's uh, coming out of the, you know, kind of just uh, gravity, or if you're getting it out to someone that has a sparkler, uh, you know, if you prime it, you know, you, you prime it at different levels based on how it's going to come out. Because if you prime it at the same, it like, you know, for us, I, I tend to like a, a kind of lively uh, cast, so we, we prime it at a level that we get a nice kind of like fluffy head uh, from a gravity. Put that through a sparkler and, and like, you know, if you take it to like, if you get it out, we, so we, we did that and we got it out to some accounts that are starting to take more cast. That just, it just was just like over carb for them. And like, you know, and people aren't necessarily doing the proper Long like they're like the, the sellermen at these places are they're not really sellermen at this point. There's not like it was back in the day where they would actually take the time and effort to vent things and do the stuff that they need to do, um, just purely because of time and and whatnot and just education. Um, that's a whole other like thing. Uh, so just remember like where it's going and how it's being served. So and then you know um, yeah so. yeah. And what would you say lively versus normal? Like uh, what are we what are we doing Alex? I mean we're doing uh, we, we we reduced it when when we first started doing gravity casts it was three ounces of, of table sugar for a pin and then now we've reduced that to two and a half 
We might go back up. And then it was three, three, three ounces was giving us like two. I, I don't, the volumes are sort of five. Bad. I forget exactly what that would be. But it yeah, was about two, five or pretty, so. Pretty spritzy, and then. It was it was a it was a nice size. It was a nice it was lively lively enough that like yeah, you yeah. know we were getting. <laughs> and all the spa things. This is the only reason I like hate people. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you using a spa? It's only Northern England that uses spa, and I'm from Southern England, so technically we'll never use spa. Love Adrian's wall. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about um, how you use your files, when, hard file, soft file, when you use it, like, to what extent? Because yep. we have a lot of confusion about that in our house. Yep. Uh, are you talking with the kids or your house? Has <laughs> My dog doesn't care. <laughs> so we don't talk about it there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for those that don't know what they are, spiles are little wooden pegs that basically, in the traditional tapping methodology, you are hammering those in before you actually tap the beer. So it's a two-step process. You've got a soft spile, which is a soft, porous wood that you tap, or you, you knock in, and generally I would leave that for six, eight hours. Soft spile. Yeah, soft spile. Yeah. Three hours before you Six to eight hours. Yeah, because that's just gonna let CO2 come out and you know any overblow, whatever it may be. Then once you've got it soft spiled, you'll be able to take that soft spile out and then you put the hard spile in, tap it in a little bit. And the hard spile is more of a denser wood, so it's not gonna let more uh, CO2 out or as much CO2. Then I would tap it. So soft spile, hard spile, tap it. And then once you actually pull some of the beer out of it, Replace it with soft spot. That, because you need it, you need, you you need the it air flow yeah, yeah. to that. Okay, it. that's the part we didn't have in, the, in, the, in that, that last. Yeah. Now, it also depends. Like, if you're doing a beer festival, you're rushing against time. Mm -hmm. You get there an hour, two hours mm -hmm. before setup, you're not going to have that time time period to be able to let it rest and stuff like that. Right. Uh, and everyone who comes to a beer festival that's drinking car scale, they, for the most part, know that, you know, this is going to be a little bit much money. Um, so under that scenario, I would hard spile it. While it's under hard spile, I would bleed the tap after I've tapped it. And then that will allow you to put out the hard spile and drop the soft spile. Uh, about, so, I'm sorry, I didn't think about how long you leave the hard spile. Like, what percentage, roughly, of the cast do you go through before you swap the hard spile? Back in for the soft spot. Just in general or a festival? In general. In, no, no, in general. If I'm going to do on, like, on my. On my oh, uh, then, like, as soon as you drop that hard spile in, yeah. and you kind of want to hammer it in fairly hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to the point you don't want it basically blowing out to the CO2 build up in there. Uh, tap it. Yeah. Bleed off some of that beer from okay. the tap, and then that should allow you to actually wiggle the hard spot, okay. put it out, and then replace it with the soft spot. Yeah. 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 Another question? I was just going to say this is definitely a really great, um, like, a, sort of interesting sort of segment. And I think I speak on, like, pretty much behalf of everyone in here, that all the classes that have been here the last few days, this is definitely been one of them. Thanks. To great chat. Dude! What you oh. <laughs> did, did you pay? I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> oh, Chuck's in the mail. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what's in that bag? Um, I wanted to... Could you brush up on, so for, for those that don't have an engine, um, can you talk in terms of best storage procedures, if you're not going to, if we're not going to kick a cast in two hours, like your buddy yeah. there? Yeah. Um, yeah, really the goal should be kick a cast, but within that time variable you're allocating to that cast. Sorry. Because, yeah, you can reintroduce the hard style to do it. You can take it downstairs, put it in your cooler, whatever. You know, putting it in your normal cooler is not going to hurt that beer. Uh, it will hurt the consumer and the education for the consumer if you were to bring it back the day after, right from the fridge to start serving. Let it come up in temperature a little bit so they get the real experience. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really where it's going to come down to mindset marketing on all right, how are we going to attract an audience? What oh. size are we going to do on the cask of pin? or a, a firkin. If you feel old enough to do a hogshead, I won't get one of those. <laughs> um, then 
Bravo to you. Um, but yeah, I mean, those were the you can hard spire it at the end of it, right. put it in your quarter, bring it out the following day. But every single minute that you take that hard spot out, it's right. deteriorating yeah. in terms of CO2. Just for, for us, like when we, we, would, we would do it on a Friday, if we didn't kick it, we would reintroduce it on Saturday, uh, and then we would even do Sunday, but we would not take it beyond that. Uh, we would we would just yeah. we would eat the loss of whatever that was just purely for the sake of having a, a quality product even though you know it's kind of deteriorated over those days it's still right. still uh, there but after that I we won't you know go into a Monday and insert it. Yeah, yeah. Hard spile it. Just get it in. Yeah. Keep you know be as you know because yeah. you also have less less uh, less you know volume in there, so right. it'll slosh around a little easier and you know, like uh, uh, you know and settle a little yeah. bit. Too. And also in that regard, I'm sorry, we'll get more back this. We'll get to it in a sec. Um, but let's say you've got bar top yeah. and you serve it from that bar top out of then it's a pin. You sell forty pints. You got twenty pints left. The minute you move that, you're in really sharp, uh, shoveling up all that yeast and so on and so on. So it's just going to take it longer to clear. Following morning, you bring it down and same thing. So yeah, wherever possible, just sell the shit out of it. Even if you get to the end of a service and you realize we've got 20 pints, it's probably going to be better to figure out the cost in your head of producing that, uh, uh, that pin or that fur pin and say, all right, we're going to do a special at the end of the night, five bucks a pint. So that way you're clear and not running into it. Nicholas. It's me again. Um, <laughs> wood or plastic chips and keystones? Uh, <laughs> we've tried both. Um, wood are horrible. Mm. Had so many leakage issues with the wood <laughs> on and, and everything. Uh, so plastic is a lot easier. Yeah, I was gonna say like we when we do we have a cast fest every year and we've taken you know we have thirteen to. 16 pins or firkins on and the only time i've ever seen an issue where like the the wood or like whatever got moldy one of those things got moldy was because it was wood it, it's just it's just accepting other bacteria or whatever and you're just like you're like Ugh. that's like it's taking on stuff where the plastic never does uh not that i've seen yeah as or oh, if you were talking about uh Never plastic. Always uh, oh, stainless steel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plastic with cheap. Yeah. Uh, now I'm in the middle. Uh, yeah, I, I guess the one thing I would say going back to the idea of, of hard spiling and putting back in a walk in or something me. is to be sure that the education of your staff is at a level that they're going because Jason or I may not be at the brewery on, on the hopefully most weekends. If they bring it out of the if they bring it out of the, the walk in and it tastes like shit, I don't want them putting it out. Oh yeah. You know, I, so I love it when uh, and I've had it as well with staff. So we put like a festival beer downstairs and we decide, yeah, we're gonna put it bar top on the following day. And you see them walking up and they're not like holding the rack that it's on, being really careful, walking up, trying not to jostle it too much. They've literally taken the cast out and they're holding it by yeah. the top. But it's like, <laughs> you just dumped all of that on its head. Yeah, so coming from a brewery that has no cast bar bring, and I don't think we ever have, mm -hmm. how do you, like, it seems like this entire conversation of like, hard versus soft, no idea what's going on. I'm trying to pick up as much as I can, but yeah. if, as a brewer, I'm struggling this much, how do I get buy in from all the other parties that will be involved in the program to take the time to learn about it and spend the money to get cast? And how do you know, yeah. basically get a program started where everyone's happy with it? Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, first off, reach out to me, I'll give you my call. Uh, you know, I'm more than happy to engage with you and engage with your senior team, whatever it might, maybe any of those stakeholders that you need to kind of get on board, more than happy to. Um, really, I think it's kind of just emphasizing, yes, there's gonna be investment required. If you don't have the setup, if you don't have the spiles, they're not expensive. I mean, to be honest, you can go to UK Brewing, you can buy a hard spile for, I think it's like 26 cents. Uh, a soft spile is like 15 cents. The biggest investment you're gonna have to put in will be either the cask itself, 
So you buy a firkin, um, a 10.8 gallon firkin, I think it's like 145 bucks. Uh, again, from UK Brewing or a lot of the guys out here, they're doing them as well. Um, but then depending on what your serving methodology is going to be. Mm -hmm. Now, my recommendation to you, being kind of new to the cast game, start doing bar top. Because all you'll need to do is buy a rack for it. It won't cost you much. You can build your own rack. I'll send you a template that I have for building your own one. Um, and then the tap, and the taps are pretty cheap as well. Once you build that program and you've got those people engaging with it, kind of coming in because they know you're tapping it, it'll be worth investing in a beer engine. Uh, <coughs> Woodland Beer Fest uh, is a great festival. Um, and one of the things I saw for the first time, I think you were just saying, is you can actually re-engineer uh, pallets uh, yeah. to actually hold yeah. the, did that's you just say that? Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So super, some, like you, there's probably a design or something, but um, yeah. yeah. And I'll also say, um, you know, the expo up here has been awesome, just meeting you, like people in the expo, learning about new technologies and everything like that, but talking to some of the, the cask and cake producers up there, or you know, uh, dealers up there, what I want to do, there's one guy that I was talking to, and they're trying to get rid of inventory. Because they don't want it sitting in a warehouse. So he's got like 300 casks sitting in a warehouse right now. He's like, how many do you need? I'm like, oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> uh, and he was like, all right, well, I'll call you next week because we can probably figure out a deal because we just want shot of these casks because we just don't sell enough of them. I'm like, all right, well, that's a great opportunity for me Who's to it? work with you. And then let's try and figure something out with all the other breweries. To be like, all right, let's buy something on bulk, and then you get whatever cast you want, two casts, three casts, whatever it might be. You're like, group buy. Yeah. It, it just offer buying a loose new lot, like a regular Furby Friday, and our guy from Queens, and when we first got into it, like UK Brewing Spies was, you know, kind of the spot on the stage to go up Yep. Yep. Uh, but there's a book, this one pamphlet called Celebrantship. That I would recommend everybody read it. Like when you threw it the Hog Center, like I just love learning the, the vocabulary of this book. It's fucking amazing. I mean, art style, soft spots, that's all cool. Uh, right. Still engine, and like I just love tots and bunny, yeah. all of it. It's really <coughs> fascinating. A lot of fun to, to just learn something that we, are, we all know a lot about beer, but like what Brian is doing is this, you know, it, it, a lot of people are doing it, but like what Brian is talking about is so cool and it's so. Awesome to do, it. and it's it's like you're like you're learning a new vocabulary, and, uh, you know, and, and for us, and if we pull five pounds out of a fifteen barrel batch, and you throw it, you know, you can do literally whatever you want. So buy in from from you know ownership on down. You're, you're literally pulling five gallons out of taking of something you already brewed. And know you whatever you want with it. Yeah, you're creating a new market as well. And, and there are things over time as you kind of it's, it's continue a, down the path of doing car scales. Like if you want to become the known place for car scale in your location or your area or your region, uh, there's a thing called cast marquee, which is a badge you can get. Uh, they come out, they do the inspections on how you're pouring, how you're serving, uh, and there's standards around all of that as well. But again, it's something you can tell. And there are tens of thousands of people in the US that will hunt out cask marquee locations to enjoy their beers because they know they're going to get the best quality cask ale they can. In the there, there's a guy in, this, uh, in New York, uh, Nigel. Um, you will, if you ever host a festival, you will probably meet Nigel. He's, Nigel's great. And see him from to Seneca to Woodland to our play. Like, he's just like, if, there, if it's cast, he'll be there. Yep. Wherever you are, you put on a cast, you know there's a crowd. A certain crowd is going to say people will travel. They're not your regulars, and you won't see one day you don't have a cast. You know, you put a cast on, you've got this crew coming in. But there is a passionate fan base there to get to. 
Yeah. 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 Have you found that some marketing that say on social media, like more more cast lovers on Facebook or Instagram or kind of everywhere? So personally, I don't do Instagram. Okay. I don't know why. I just don't know how. It we works. just have two phones. Like I mean, I'm a tech nerd at heart. I have no idea how Instagram even works. Twitter the same thing, but Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Facebook, definitely. Uh, there is a big market on Facebook of people, there are even groups that are casting lovers on Facebook, uh, kind of, and that plays into people will travel from a long way away for a car scale. So, give you a scenario my bar uh, and tap room, this was probably like two years ago, um, I had a guy call me, he was like, hey, I'm from New York City. Just heard, I think through Nigel, just heard you do car scale. So I'm coming down there on Saturday. I'm going to drive my, we had a, uh, an old BW bus. Um, do you mind if I park in the parking lot and maybe stay at night? Well, all right, sure. So he comes and he's there at my tap room at 9.30 in the morning. Don't open the door I do. So he comes in and he sits at the end of the bar. And we had like, I think, 10 beers on tap at that point, and he was drinking a 10 ounce half pint. He started at one end. He didn't have any logic behind it. He was just like, I'm starting here. And then he works his way all the way to the end, goes back to the beginning, and goes again. He didn't leave my bar till 11 o'clock that night. He ends up walking out into the parking lot, getting into his VW van, saying, Hey, really appreciate it. Love your cars, girl. I'll be back again. I wake up at 7 o'clock the following morning, he's bowing off. <laughs> I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, people will travel for it if, if you can get the word out and you market it to them and so forth. So, definitely. I mean, just one of the things on the market side, uh, you know, uh, I was originally from Rochester, so there's that, you know, for anybody that's up around that time, back in 2000, 2000 to 2005, there were a handful of uh, bars that did it uh, pretty frequently and uh, well. Uh, moved to the city in 2005, there were a bunch. There was a, a kind of a downturn uh, after a little while. A lot of programs that, that had uh, cast uh, programs in their bars, uh, and that kind of that took a downturn as kind of like hazy IPAs and craft, uh, like kind of craft in general started peaking. What I'm seeing now is that you're getting more dedicated, like the really dedicated bars that stuck around or have opened and, and really have a program are like doing it and doing it well. They're treating the cask well. Uh, so many of those bars in the back time were like not treating them well. They were just kind of letting it go just to like, and it became shit. The lines were just not great. Like, you're like, this is, you know, you're, and that's like, will also lead to it. So the more that you treat these, you know, treat it with care, kiss it, like treat it well, you know, the, the beer will be served better and appreciated better and people will get excited by it. When the, when these programs, there is more, time and effort involved in it and getting your staff on, on board. So, but when you do it and you do it well, it's, it's just like, you know, it's, it's just, it's awesome. And, you know, there are, it's starting to, I think, slowly grow again with really dedicated programs. Um, so, you know, it, you know, foster those ones, foster what's going on in your, your tap room. And, you know, it, I, I, I hope to see it kind of thrive and strive like you were, you were hoping for in the beginning. Definitely. I mean, that's my main goal of wanting to come up here. You know, number one, I love my accent and I hope you do as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's really, I want to see guys to be inspired to go back and be like, to your point. Just throw out words and ask him to say it. Let's try a car. Let's try something. Let's do something and try and grow. And that's my goal, because, like I say, I'm British, born there, lived there, raised there. Uh, I'm actually an American citizen now, but I'm still British, really. Um, you know, and I grew up on this stuff. I think I had my first pint of cast air three years old. Um, so, so I want to see more growth of cast air in New York State. I think there's a massive amount that we can do to grow it, and that will benefit you guys, it will benefit the industry, it will help us like be on a pinnacle of like the car scale movement in the US versus any other state out there as well. So you'll hear a lot from me and the Brewers Association uh, moving forwards in like more uh, educational sessions we can do via Zoom and stuff like that as well. Um, you know, I know we're coming up on time here. Um, we do a car scale festival in May. So I would encourage any and each and every one of you 
Come be a part of it. Go out, buy that version, or buy that pin. Sign up. You don't buy or pay for the beer. We buy the beer from you. You also get a whole host of other perks, like free boozy lobster dinner and everything else as well. <laughs> um, but come and do it, because we're going to see these people that love cask ale. And those are people that come from miles and miles away. What the, and maybe I differ a little, a little on you on this, but like, I really don't think there's a style. It's it's a, it's a serving tank. It's a it's a it it's a way. I think you know you can play around with the the carbonation. You can play around with the ingredients. I don't think there's a style that you can't do in a pin or a firkin and, and have it. I I of my own you know in my own mind. I I think it can be pretty open. So. Don't feel limited to, to what, you know, you're like, well, I don't know that I want to have a, a mild or a bitter. Like, I think there, there are options. I mean, one of the best casts I had was a dry hopped uh, IPA from Heavy Seas down in like National CBC in 2000. I don't know what the fuck it was. It was like, whatever, when I first started, 12? I don't know, whatever, something. Sorry, language. I did not say that. Edit that out. Yeah, and I mean, to that exact point, I would challenge yourself to come up with the coolest beer you can do in cask, because that's just going to help from the education and the consumer standpoint in the fact that, again, we go back to that slide uh, that people were like, they don't understand cask ale. The minute you start talking to people about cask ale, they're like, well, it's going to be a bitter, or it's going to be a mild, or it's going to be one of these English beers. <clears throat> but to Jason's point, it's not. The cask is a vessel, and it's just uh, served in a different methodology. Yeah, yeah. And use that to your advantage to really profile <laughs> your creative skills in beer that you can give out to the consumer. Start so, uh, I just, I, you just reminded me I follow um, Wildfields Fruit House. They're out in California, but they do on their Instagram their Friday cast. Um, and it's, you know, they're throwing Sour Patch Kids in there or whatever, but there's a little reel oh, yeah. video. Like, you could just, if you wanted a way to make it to start and get people to be really engaged, just make it fun. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be some fireball. That's, I mean, that's a great point. I was telling someone the other day, and I forget the brewery name, but again, they do a, like a first in during the partnership. And they were like, what they do is they take that beer that they brew that they're kegging, and they take it and they twist their star. All right, what are we going to throw in this one? And it could be a sour patch kid. It could be whatever adjunct they want. They sell that beer in the cask so fast because they've already got this market of people that love this beer. And they're coming in, drinking it, buying it on keg and on draft. But now suddenly they've tapped into this market of, oh, that sounds really good. I want to go drink this quadruple IPA with sour patch kids in. I'm going to go down and try it. And they go down, they sell them another pint, whatever it may be. So that's a really easy in. Use that beer, throw whatever you want into it, and market it to your advantage. And a couple of bottles here. Come on. So, um, I don't know if this is a question for Jason for you, but I was curious if you're going to Actually, never brought it up in all the conversations you've had about this. So, when we used to do gas, and we had a lot of big things, and I bought everything that was in the I bought it as a bleeder, so I wouldn't do a soft file. In the bleeder, right. leave it off, and then, then switch the slide up. Um, but I also mm -hmm. use ice blankets that I'll serve on the bar top because, yeah. yes, it's warmer, it's important to know it's, it's not room temperature, it's cellar temperature. So right. You know, yeah. And there's a difference. There is. So I guess, how do you feel about ice blankets? Like, you're here who is all beer energy. So I don't matter to you, I don't chase it. Right. I, I'm curious for both of you how you feel about it. From my perspective, Ice blankets and cooling methodologies really come down more to festivals. To your point, you know, I've got 14 beer and they're going to fire and we're loving on through Sunday. Right. Um, ice blankets are good. I think, I mean, there is, there's also kind of a bullshit thing behind ice blankets, really. Because the ice blankets lay on the top of the beer <clears throat> or on the top of the car. Well, as you're pouring the beer, the beer's going down. There needs to be something developed that sits underneath it, because that's always going to touch the speed. But that's more semantics. Uh, but yeah, I mean, ice blankets can definitely help. Yeah, ice blankets can help. I mean, I, I think it's just kind of depends on, on the temperature of what's going on. We won't put a nice blanket, but sometimes we'll do. Uh, 
you know, a damp, uh, like a wet uh, rag, uh, kind of rag or cloth. It kind of sits over most of it like it would. Yeah, like, it envelopes it. You know, the evaporation will so then help like chill the, the vessel, which will then like keep the beer at like a stable temperature versus like shooting up or anything. Yeah. Uh, hey? right. yeah. So, you know, we, we've talked I'm before. Scared. You're it's, asking me a question. I, I said am. you earlier, I was like, fuck, oh, right. Dean's here. I've been doing this since early 2000s um, and uh, <laughs> won a couple of awards for Cascale, stuff like that. But we found that the, the insulation blanket, the, the ice blanket, and then with the insulation wrap over the firkin um, to, do, to do out at festivals uh, was really incredibly helpful because way back when, people didn't want Cascale. Right. They was, it was warm, it was flat, it was disgusting, it, old man like me. Um, and you know, it was, it was interesting because they wanted it a little more chill than cellar temperature, 48. You know, they wanted it in the 40s and I think that made it a little bit more approachable and then with the cask, you know, with the, with the actual blanket around it, the ice blanket and the, and the wrap, the full wrap right. um, was kind of nice to help insulation for festivals and it, 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 it sped up sales a lot when it was a little colder. Yeah. So yeah. And, it, and it helps CO two a little bit better as well. So yeah. yeah. What is what is your temp? What, what's the temp of your cellar? Uh, so we moderate our temp between fifty two and fifty seven. Anywhere between fifty two and fifty seven is really the the standard in of a the cast down. During the middle of the summer. So again, like you guys have chillers, coolers, whatever. You come to my brewery. It's so manual barbaric, historic, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we have an air conditioning system with a cool bottle that allows us to maintain that temperature to 52 to 57 degrees, and that's what we need it for as well. Uh, you know, I've seen uh, Joneswood Foundry up in New York City. We do contract room for them, uh, their own brand and stuff as well. Uh, they have a really cool setup. They have a beer engine on the, on the bar. And then underneath, it's like one of those horse drinking troughs. They pack with ice and they drop the cask in there and then they have a cask widget in there and they're putting it from that. And that gets them five days worth of pouring from that because at the end of the night, they're just topping it up with ice. They stop and then they've elongated the line going up. So as the beer's going up, it's getting a little bit more of a temperature differential as it's going up the line as well. So, I mean, that's a quickie. It's something under the bar you can slide it. We got time for like maybe one or two more questions. Oh, I'm here to the left. Okay, <laughs> just bug him all night. Cool. Awesome. Well, like I say, I appreciate everyone coming out. Um, I can talk about this for decades. Uh, if you want my card, grab me. Uh, I would also encourage all of you come out and have fun at our festival. Do a cast. Let's take the cast resolution. Resu uh, resolution. Revolution, and let's move it forward. <laughs> <laughs>